Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, ACQC Chancellor, the Australian National University, and today's speaker. Thank you very much, Gareth, for taking time from what I'm sure is a busy schedule for your University Senate, as it is for ours at this time of the year. Members of the University Senate and the University Senior Management Group, Professor Tim Dunn, Co-Director, Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, and our MC today, UQ colleagues and students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I think I can now safely say good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to be here today with you, you all to del deliver just a few introductory remarks to today's public lecture that will be presented by the prof uh, Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans. In 2010, we were very fortunate to host Gareth uh, at Customs House, where he delivered the second of the UQ centenary orations, and that was a very well-received event at the time. Three years later, we're, we're delighted to welcome him back to UQ to deliver this public lecture for the Asia-Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect. The centre, as many of you will know, is the only regional centre of its kind specifically dedicated to advancing the Responsibility to Protect principle commonly known as R2P, through policy-relevant research, training and advocacy. Now in its second phase of development, this, the centre is very fortunate to be resourced by both AusAid and the University of Queensland. When it comes to R2P, as Tim said, there is no one more significant and indeed more appropriate to speak than today's speaker. Gareth was a Cabinet Minister for 13 years and then later Foreign Minister from 1988 to 1996, a period during which Australia's influence in the wider international community was considerable and very much in, in the ascendance. Since leaving office, Gareth has co-chaired two major international commissions. The most recent of these was on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament from uh, 2008 to 2010, Yet it was his work on the 2000 to 2001 Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty that is most directly related to today's occasion, given that it is through this Commission that the concept of R2P was first formulated. In light of this contribution, it's hardly surprising that in the broad field of international relations, Gareth is regarded as the norm entrepreneur of R2P. Now, men, some of you will know in this room that in a previous life I used to work on attitudes and normative change and understanding the processes by which social norms develop and impact on behaviour, but I'd never heard that term before. So it almost made me want to go back into my discipline and put that term into social psychology. But I won't digress. I think in the case of Gareth, it is a very apt description. He is the person that not only changed the discourse and script around how the international community should respond to national atrocities, but the person who has championed a change in the approach. That is away from a debate on the right to intervene to one that focuses on the responsibility of the international community to protect inhabitants of states in which atrocities are occurring. In his words, this was essential given that our response as an international community in relation to situations in places like Somalia and Bosnia was, and I quote, too little, too late, misconceived, poorly resourced, poorly executed, or all of the above. On the basis of Professor Evans' very significant contributions to foreign policy and international relations, he was made a companion of the Order of Australia, AC, in June 2012, the honour was for eminent service to international relations, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, as an advisor to governments on global policy matters, to conflict uh, prevention and resolution, and to arms control and disarmament. It is very fitting that he has accepted our invitation to present today's public lecture, hosted by the Asia-Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, and it's also very fitting that it gives me an opportunity on behalf of the university to thank Professor Evans for his ongoing support and input as a patron of the centre. So in closing, I'm delighted to present to you Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, ACQC, who will speak on the topic of mass atrocity crimes after Syria, the future of the responsibility to protect. 
please join me in welcoming you. Guys. Well, thank you very much, Deborah Terry. Thank you very much, Tim Dunn, for those very generous and somewhat over-the-top introductions. Uh, thanks to the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect for hosting today's event. Thanks to UQ, of course, more generally. Distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen. The long paralysis, the long paralysis of the UN Security Council in the face of the Syrian crisis, at least until the large-scale use of chemical weapons recently proved to be something of a game changer, has raised fundamental questions as to how far we really have come with the responsibility to protect, or R2P as it's abbreviated. Just how much vitality, how much utility is left in this new doctrine that was unanimously embraced with much hope, much fanfare, by more than 150 heads of state and government at the World Summit commemorating the 60th anniversary of the UN in 2005. Is R2P an idea whose, whose time has come, but now gone? While R2P may be down, my view is that it's certainly not out, for three reasons that I'll spell out. First, there still is effectively universal consensus now about its basic principles. Secondly, those principles have shown their worth in real world cases, and the Security Council has continued to invoke them even after it became divided over Libya and has been paralysed on Syria. And third, it's possible to see how the consensus that matters most in the Security Council on the hardest of cases, those which might only be capable of being resolved by the use of coercive military force, it's possible to see, I believe, how that consensus could be recreated in the future. But let me begin at the beginning to understand how important an, inv an innovation, the new responsibility to protect and protect doctrine has been. We need, do need to understand where we were before it came along, before it was born. To evaluate how serious a midlife crisis R2P might now be facing, we need to be equally very clear about what precisely were its intended scope and limits. The emergence of Responsibility to Protect was really a response to a very real international problem. The continuing inability of the international community, notwithstanding the embrace of the Genocide Convention and many other new international human rights and international humanitarian law, uh, standards after World War II, the inability of the international community to effectively prevent or halt mass atrocity crimes, genocide, major war crimes, ethnic cleansing, other major crimes against hu humanity. When those crimes occurred behind the walls, the borders of sovereign states, the issue came to a head with the horrifying massacres in Rwanda in Bosnia in the 1990s, and with the complete absence in the Security Council, as shown again with Kosovo in 1999, or anywhere else, of any consensus, any consensual support for the essentially North-sponsored idea of humanitarian intervention. While troubled by these atrocities, countries of the global south were simply unwilling to acknowledge any general right to intervene militarily in any state, whatever the circumstances. And that, in a sense, was pretty understandable because many of the countries of the Global South were newly independent, very proud of their newly won sovereignty, very conscious of their fragility, and very mindful, in many cases, of a long historical experience of Mission Civilisatrice, civilising missions by the various imperial powers. So they just weren't in the business of acknowledging a right of humanitarian intervention, a right of coercive military intervention. The flag under which they marched, the countries of the global south overwhelmingly, was a very narrow reading of the non-intervention language of Article 2.7 of the UN Charter. Nothing shall authorise the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. Of course, 
what is within the domestic jurisdiction of a state is something to be argued about given the then new standards of international law and international humanitarian law. Maybe it wasn't as easy as it had been in the past to draw those parameters, but those niceties were rather swept aside and it was non-intervention on the one hand versus the right of intervention, the right of military intervention on the other. But that standoff, and it was a very real standoff right through the 1990s, did leave quite unanswered the challenge that was posed by Kofi Annan as UN Secretary General in his 2000 Millennium Address to the General Assembly when he said famously, I quote, if, human if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity? Well, it was to answer that challenge and to try to build a new international political consensus that the Canadian government sponsored this International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, of which you've heard, which I was asked to co-chair along with the very distinguished African diplomat, Mohamed Sanoun, and which had a very distinguished international cast. As, and that commission came up in 2001 with this concept of the responsibility to protect. Without going into any of the, the detail, as subsequently refined through discussion over the next five years, and as subsequently endorsed, finally, by the General Assembly at the 2005 World Summit, the new doctrine had three key dimensions, three key distinguishing characteristics. First of all, its language, which recharacterized the issue, which recharacterized the debate as being not about the right to intervene, but the responsibility to protect. In other words, changing the language of right, particularly the notion big guys right to throw their weight around militarily, changing the notion of right to the language of responsibility, changing the language of intervention to the language of protection, and thus putting the emphasis on the victims. And language can be pretty important in the international debate on these issues. It is true that I was the one, I think, that came up with that phrase. It wasn't actually at the first meeting. It was in the shower before the first meeting when I thought, well, this mightn't be a bad way of encapsulating what it is that we want this commission to be all about. And being young and foolish then, I said this to my fellow commissioners about five minutes into the meeting. They all fell about saying, what the hell are you on about? We haven't even discussed the issue or heard any evidence or considered our position. Here you are with a title and the chapter headings and all the rest of it. But, <laughs> But that's, uh, that's the way I like to work. Um, the second thing we did um, was to spread the responsibility, making clear that the issue was not about just the rights of intervening states, which had been the traditional language of humanitarian intervention, but rather it was a shared or spread responsibility as between, first of all, the individual states themselves, which all had the responsibility to protect their own populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity. Other states, secondly, had a responsibility to assist them to do so through physical support, financial support, personnel support, if they're in a mood to be voluntarily assisted. And thirdly, if a state was in fact manifestly failing as a result of either incapacity or ill will to protect its own people, then the third layer of engagement cut in, that of the wider international community whose responsibility then was to act more decisively to address the catastrophic situation that was present or evolving. So you spread the, uh, the cast of characters that had some relevant role to play. And thirdly, what was unique and distinctive about this um, new concept was that it broadened quite dramatically the range of appropriate responses. Whereas humanitarian intervention, language and concept itself focused one-dimensionally on military reaction. The whole concept of responsibility to protect, as we spelled it out in the Commission report and as it subsequently evolved and was spelled out in the, in the UN General Assembly document, involves multiple elements across the whole response continuum, starting very importantly with preventive action, both long and short term, moving there to reactive responses when prevention fails, but not stopping there, continuing also to a further step along the continuum 
a post-crisis rebuilding aimed really again at prevention, but this time of recurrence of the problem. The middle element, the reaction element, moreover, was itself a nuanced continuum, beginning with persuasion, moving from there to non-military forms of coercion of varying degrees of intensity, like sanctions or the threat of international criminal prosecution, and only as a last resort, contemplating coercive military force. The period from 2005, the embrace by the General Assembly of this concept, unanimous embrace, through to 2011, saw what might be described as the gradual growth to maturity of the new doctrine, or as I like to say, the new norm. Conceptual arguments as to its precise scope and limits were largely resolved, not always with much help from the academics, I have to say, who kept a lot of fires burning that should long before have been extinguished, but that's another story. Rearguard political resistance to the concept really fell away, as evidenced in particular by successive annual General Assembly debates from 2009 onwards on the topic, which I'll come back to a little later on. And it was being seen as increasingly relevant in practice, most obviously and importantly in Kenya in early 2008, when a diplomatic mission led by Kofi Annan under the auspices of both the UN and the African Union and explicitly invoking the responsibility to protect uh, doctrine did successfully defuse what you may remember was rapidly deteriorating into a Rwanda scale catastrophe. It is the case that a number of non-governmental organisations played an important, very important part during this maturing period and still do through their analysis, their advocacy, their workshops, their conferences, their training programs, played an important role in consolidating the understanding of the scope and limits of the new norm and in promoting its effective implementation in practice, not least at the crucial prevention stage. Prominent among the organisations I'm thinking of are the New York-based uh, Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, whose International Advisory Board I chair, but especially UQ's own Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, which is sponsoring today's lecture. Under the leadership of Tim Dunn, of Alex Bellamy, Noel Murata, the centre here really has done some outstanding work in basic research and conceptual analysis, in regional capacity building and diplomacy, and in the development of preventive strategies. And I really do want to congratulate uh, the centre and everyone sailing with it uh, for the contribution that it's made. That's 2005, 2011, in the case of the NGOs, still continuing. But something happened in 2011. A lot of things happened in 2011. The Security Council, when it endorsed military action, explicitly under the R2P banner in the case, first of all, of Cote d'Ivoire, which most people have forgotten about, it was uncontroversial, and then in Libya, which people haven't forgotten about, as I'll explain in much more detail, when this intervention, these interventions, military interventions, were authorised, this was widely heralded as the coming of age of the new responsibility to protect the norm. And in Libya especially, at least at the outset, this did really seem to be an absolutely textbook example of how R2P was supposed to work in practice, at least at the reaction stage when any possibility of long-term preventive action had in fact evaporated. Textbook example of how it applied in the face of a rapidly unfolding mass atrocity situation. You may remember that the Security Council response was in two stages. First of all, there was a condemnatory and sanctions imposing resolution that passed unanimously by the Security Council. And this was followed three weeks later when it seemed clear to everyone that new atrocities were imminent by the authorization with no dissenting voices of military measures to quote, protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack, close quotes. Acting under this authorisation, NATO-led forces took immediate action, and the feared massacres in Benghazi and elsewhere simply did not eventuate. And I think it's fair to say that if the Security Council had acted equally quickly and equally robustly in the 1990s, 
the 8,000 men and boys murdered in Srebrenica, and the 800,000 people murdered in Rwanda might still be alive today. But with the apparent maturity, coming of age of R2P, in this sense, also came a midlife crisis. As time went on, the Western-led intervention came under fierce attack by the BRICS countries, B-R-I-C-S countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Attacked for exceeding its narrow civilian protection mandate that I've described. Attacked for being content with nothing less than regime change, which was, of course, accomplished with the overthrow of Gaddafi in October 2011. Unhappily, that criticism translated very directly, very immediately, into Security Council paralysis in responding to what rapidly became the even more alarming situation in Syria. So from mid-2011 all the way through until September this year, when the use of chemical weapons, the most extreme atrocity crime of all, after all, fundamentally changed the dynamics of the Syrian situation, for that whole period, the Security Council could agree on almost nothing at all. Not only on the extreme step of military force, as to which there have always been many good reasons not to act, but even on much lesser coercive measures like sanctions, targeted sanctions, an arms embargo, or referral to the International Criminal Court. The attitude seems to have been, give the P3, give the US, UK, France nothing, because if you give them anything, they'll take everything. Although the P3 continue to be very defensive about their implementation through NATO of the Libyan mandate, the truth of the matter is that unless and until there is some recognition of what went wrong in Libya, it will be extremely difficult ever again to secure an unvetoed majority vote for tough action, even action falling considerably short of military action in a hard mass atrocity case, at least an atrocity case not involving the use of weapons of mass destruction. The recent highly welcome Security Council action to authorise the destruction of Syrian chemical weapons after the Ghouta massacre in August this year, a resolution which foreshadowed consideration of coercive action under Chapter 7 of the Charter should the Syrian regime not cooperate, could easily have been portrayed in very explicit R2P, responsibility to protect terms. R2P language could have been easily and properly invoked in that context. But I think it's clear that the Security Council was still in no mood to do that. And it's best understood, its resolution, as a specific response to the proven use of a weapon of mass destruction in that case. And I think it has to be assumed that in a responsibility to protect case without this weapons of mass destruction dimension, there will still be a reluctance by the Council to endorse tough action, unless and until the concerns of the BRICS states start being taken seriously, voicing as they do the concerns of a much wider swathe of the developing world. So where does all that leave R2P now? Where does it leave the future for R2P? My view is that the situation is not all bleak by any means for the three reasons that I foreshadowed at the outset, which I'll now spell out. In the first place, there still is effectively universal consensus now about the basic principles of R2P. The best evidence for this again is the series of statements that have been made in successive annual General Assembly debates or interactive dialogues, so-called, on the subject which have taken place since 2009. No state now disagrees that every sovereign state has the responsibility to the best of its ability to protect its own people from the four crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, major war crimes. No state disagrees that others have the responsibility, other states have the responsibility to the best of their ability to assist that state to do so, to protect its own people. 
And it really is the case that no state now seriously continues to challenge the principle that the wider international community should respond with timely and decisive collective action when a state is manifestly failing to meet its responsibility to protect its own people. Certainly, there is less general comfort with this last pillar, the timely intervention stuff, than with the first two. And there will always be argument about what precise form action should take in a particular case. But the basic principles are not under challenge. In this year's annual General Assembly debate on RTP, which took place in mid-September, in which 68 countries, more than ever before, participated, there was evident, again, overwhelming support for these basic principles. And that support was um, repeated two weeks later in many strong leaders' statements in the general debate opening the new General Assembly session. The Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, has repeatedly said, our debates are now about how, not whether, to implement the responsibility to protect. The second reason I think RTP certainly has a long life ahead of it is that these principles have shown their worth in real world cases and the Security Council has continued to invoke them even after it divided over Libya and became paralysed on Syria. There's plenty of evidence, in other words, that R2P does mean in practice more than just words. Most notably, there was the case of Kenya in 2008 when diplomatic action, as I've said, was quick and effective. And there's been the <coughs> cases, of course, of Cote d'Ivoire and Libya, which for all the controversy the latter generated, um, the Security Council did effectively authorise the use of military force and did stop mass atrocity <coughs> crimes occurring. And for all its divisions over Libya and Syria, I think it's important to appreciate that the Security Council has actually continued since 2011 to use explicit R2P language where appropriate, for example, in resolutions that it's passed on Yemen and South Sudan and Mali, and also presidential statements that have been made on the role of prevention in international peace and security, and very recently, just last month, the 2nd of October, on the humanitarian situation in Syria. <coughs> Third, and this is the reason on which I want to spend most time, for being a little bit optimistic, <coughs> for all the division, and again, and paralysis which has occurred over Libya and Syria, I think it is possible to see how the consensus that matters most, that's to say, in the Security Council, in relation to the hardest of cases, could actually be recreated in the future. It's important to emphasise that the, the disagreement now evident in the Security Council is really only about how the R2P norm is to be applied in the hardest cases the sharp end cases, those where prevention has manifestly failed and the harm to civilians being experienced or being feared is so great that the issue of military force has to at least prima facie be given consideration. But of course these are the talismanic cases and if consensus has broken down at the highest political level on how these sorts of cases should be handled, there is a danger. There's a real danger of flow on risk to the credibility of the whole responsibility to protect enterprise. So how can that consensus begin to be restored? The key to the future, I think we need to delve into this in a little bit more detail now, the key to the future is recognising what went wrong in the past and in particular what went wrong with Libya. There was no problem at the outset, but a major one did arise when, as I've already indicated in passing, it became rapidly apparent that the three permanent members of the Security Council driving the intervention, France, US, UK, would settle, in fact, for nothing less than regime change and do whatever it took to achieve that. The BRICS countries, <coughs> all of them then represented on the Council, argued fiercely that the narrow civilian protection mandate was being exceeded, in particular when the P3 dismissed without any willingness to engage in serious exploration various peace overtures that were made by Gaddafi or actors, others acting on his behalf. And they had a pretty strong case. While some of the counter arguments that one hears do have some force of their own, in particular the counter argument that if civilians were to be protected in areas under Gaddafi's immediate control, if they were protected 
if they were to be protected from house to house searches by goons and thugs in cities like Tripoli and taken, being protected, and to be protected from being carted off to prison and tortured and executed, then this couldn't be achieved by threats of airstrikes from 30,000 feet. It could only be achieved by achieving regime change. But the P3 resisted debate on these arguments at any stage of the process in the Security Council itself. And other council members were simply never given sufficient information to enable these sorts of arguments to be evaluated. Maybe not all the BRICS countries, Russia in particular, are to be believed when they say that had better process been followed, more common ground could have been achieved. But I think they can all be believed when they say that they feel bruised by the P3's dismissiveness during the Libyan campaign, and again, that these bruises will have to heal before any consensus can be expected on tough responses to such situations in the future. So it's not entirely coincidental that over the last two years, the P3 has come actually to be commonly described around the corridors. New York, <coughs> not with so much with that acronym, acronym but a rather more acerbic acronym, which is put together, uh, putting in alphabetical order, and you can work this out for yourself, France, F for France, UK and US. <laughs> this is the atmosphere that you find in New York at the moment. The good news is that there are now some signs from the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, representing the mainstream developing world countries and those who like to sail with them, that they're looking to, there are some signs, they're looking to re-establish some common ground. And there's three such signs I want to talk about quickly. The initial proposal that came from Brazil at the end of 2011, which it labelled responsibility while protecting. The interest that's been shown very recently by China, last month in fact, in a very similar concept, which scholars there label responsible protection. And in the interest shown by Russia even more recently, last week in fact, in both these concepts. The Brazilian proposal, which was initially articulated in statements to the UN by both its President and Foreign Minister in late 2011, subsequently by its permanent rep to the UN, uh, the Brazilian proposal is that the idea be accepted of not replacing R2P, but supplementing it with a complementary set of principles and procedures which is labelled Responsibility While Protecting, or RWP. Although there were some distracting features in the initial presentations which have engaged much academic commentary, I might say again, ever since, um, including, for example, the apparent insistence initially that the three pillars of R2P and the measures to advance each in turn had to march in some kind of strict chronological sequence. As the notion of RWP has evolved in subsequent discussions in New York and Brazil, in a number of which, in fact, I and my colleagues in the Global Centre in New York have participated, it seems clear that the Brazilian proposal has come down to just two substantive elements. First, there should be a set of prudential criteria, including in particular last resort, proportionality and balance of consequences, fully debated and taken into account before the Security Council mandates any use of military force. And that's something for which my own commission and subsequent UN reports have long argued. The second element in the Brazilian proposal is that there should be some kind of enhanced monitoring and review processes which would enable such mandates to be seriously debated by all council members during their implementation phase with a view to ensuring so far as possible that consensus is maintained throughout the course of an operation. The initial reaction by the P3 powers, or the alternative acronym if you prefer, to the Brazilian RWP proposal when it was first articulated was very sceptical. These countries would want all these delaying and spoiling tactics options, wouldn't they? But I think their Syrian experience, the frustration of their Syrian experience, dealing with this paralysis, which continues there, has begun to compel some rethinking. 
realization that it will indeed be very hard to get unvetoed majority support for any kind of tough action in an RTP case in the future has led them, on the evidence of my own conversations in New York and capitals over the last couple of years, to be much less contemptuously dismissive than they initially were. With Brazil no longer a member of the Security Council, it's shown less interest actually in continuing to play an active leadership role in keeping the RWP idea alive. But in some very interesting and very recent developments in which I and my global centre colleagues have again been involved, there have been signs, as I foreshadowed, that the two BRICS countries that matter most in this context because of their veto-wielding powers, namely China and Russia, may actually be interested in pursuing these ideas further. The first sign was a two-day meeting in Beijing last month hosted by the Foreign Ministry's own in-house think tank, the China Institute of International Studies. And let me tell you, think tanks like this don't have these sorts of conferences without very clear endorsement from higher up, which brought together specialist scholars and practitioners from China and the other BRICS countries, together with a handful of Western specialists, including me, to discuss what would be involved in the concept of responsible protection. Although no outcome was formally agreed or made public from that Beijing meeting, which was, I believe, the first of its kind ever to be held in that country, several themes emerged from it which I found both intriguing and encouraging. First, there was widespread acceptance that R2P was here to stay. Responsibility to protect was here to stay. True, it was the case that some Chinese scholars remain inclined to argue that the entire R2P enterprise, particularly its sanction of military action in, except in exceptional cases, was really just old neo-interventionist wine in new bottles, language which you still do hear from some uh, post-colonial scholars around the place. Um, but this really did not appear to be a majority sentiment, nor did it stop anyone from engaging in lively discussion of how the R2P doctrine could be most effectively implemented in practice in all its dimensions. Secondly, there was widespread agreement that what had caused the acknowledged breakdown of consensus in the Security Council concerning how to respond to events in Syria and the succession of atrocity crimes before chemical weapons came along, um, there, it was, the view was that it was not an attempt by the global south to revive outdated notions of unlimited sovereignty, but rather it was exactly as I've described it, a reaction to the perceived overreach of the NATO-led military intervention there in Libya in 2011. Thirdly, and I think most importantly, there was widespread agreement about how consensus within the Security Council on these hardest of cases might be recreated. The idea was that our 2 p should be enriched, this was the, the language, enriched by the acceptance of a complementary principle which the scholars there called responsible protection, or RP floated by the um, Chinese scholar Ruan Zongzhi in a journal article last year, explicitly referring to and building on the Brazilian RWP, Responsibility While Protecting proposal, and evidently the subject of quite a lot of internal uh, scholarly discussion since. The core elements of RP, as articulated by the Chinese participants in this debate, really did win quite strong evidence support around the table. And these were, first of all, again, tough criteria, specifically legitimate intention, last resort, proportionality, balance of consequences, should be clearly satisfied before any military mandate is granted, with every effort made to exhaust diplomatic solutions before more robust alternatives are embraced. Fair enough. Second, there should be better methods of supervision and accountability to ensure that the protection objective civilian protection objective remains at the heart of any response, and that, appropriately, the primary emphasis, the primary emphasis of the whole RTP enterprise should continue to be prevention of mass atrocity crimes, both prevention of their occurrence, prevention of their recurrence. The other very recent development to which I want to refer was the hosting in Moscow last week, right at the end of October, by, again, a very official organisation, the Diplomatic Academy, of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, apparently on the initiative Foreign, of Foreign Minister Ivanov, uh, uh, sorry, Lavrov himself, hosting a one-day meeting on responsibility to protect. 
Again, I believe the first of its kind in Russia. The participants this time were senior ministry officials and Russian academics, together with a handful of um, Western specialists, including the Global Centre's um, director, Simon Adams, and the new special, UN Special Advisor on the responsibility to protect uh, Jennifer Welsh, Professor Jennifer Welsh from Oxford. While on the reports I've heard from this meeting, it was all a little bit less focused than the Beijing event, I'm told that again, there was a lot of attention paid to the RWP concept of the Brazilians and the RP concept, currently being talked about by the Chinese, and there was an emerging sense from the meeting that Russia needed to align itself with those views. Well, it remains to be seen whether China, Russia and the other BRICS countries will now move to champion the idea of responsible protection or RWP or some variant of this concept in a more formal, officially endorsed way. My strong view is that if they do, this should not be viewed as a rearguard action designed in any way to undermine the R2P norm, but rather an effort to assume co-ownership of it. And in terms of getting serious debate about saying never again to mass atrocity crimes, in terms of not, not a serious debate, in terms of getting serious about saying never again to mass atrocity crimes, I think that's about as positive a development as anyone could hope for. If we are to break out of this post-Libya impasse, it's clear the detailed attention is going to have to be paid within the Security Council to developing better process when confronting these hard cases. I very much hope that Australia, during its remaining tenure on the Security Council, will play a leading role in generating a discussion of just these issues. And it will indeed have another opportunity to do so when it assumes the presidency of the Council for the second time in November next year. That process is going to have to require more systematic attention to the two areas highlighted in these Brazilian, Chinese, Russian debates that I've described in outline. Again, just to repeat and spell it out in a tiny bit more detail, the first thing that really is going to have to be done is to give systematic attention to these relevant prudential criteria for the use of coercive military force. Not yet adopted such criteria in any formal UN process, but which were spelled out in the initial commission report more than a decade ago and in subsequent uh, international reports and which have been very much part of the international debate since. Those criteria, and I won't stop to talk about them in detail, but the prima facie seriousness of the harm involved, the intent with which a response is mounted, the issue criterion of last resort, the criterion of proportionality, and the criterion of balance of consequences, ensuring that any intervention causes more good than harm. I don't believe personally that it's necessary to formally adopt those criteria in a General Assembly or Security Council resolution and would in fact be probably counterproductive in the UN environment to try to do that. Nor do I believe, nor can it be argued, that attention to these criteria, these benchmarks, will in practice invariably produce consensus with kind of push-button efficiency. Life's never that easy. But I do believe, I do think there's plenty of reason to believe that if an understanding develops that those arguing a case for military intervention must in practice make a detailed and compelling case that all five of those criteria would be satisfied, I think that happened. The chances of reaching consensus one way or the other would be significantly improved. The second element of a new process, the other element, would require some kind of serious ongoing review of coercive mandates once they're granted. <coughs> this is likely to be met um, with some resistance by the P3 on the ground that there has to be some flexibility in the implementation of any military mandate and that military operations can never be micromanaged. Sure, that's true. That's not an unreasonable set of concerns. But equally, there's no reason in principle or practice why broad concepts of operations, as distinct from strategy, as distinct from tactics, should not be uh, regularly debated and questioned as necessary whether civilian protection can be accomplished without full-scale war fighting, whether it can be accomplished without full-scale regime change, is exactly such a question that the P3 should always be prepared to debate. It's not necessarily a matter of establishing any new formal institutional mechanism, 
Well, it's worth remembering that sunset clauses requiring formal renewal if a mission is to continue after a given date are hardly unfamiliar in the Security Council. It's really more a matter, again, of there being some real understanding that ongoing debate on mandate implementation is wholly legitimate. My final word. If the Security Council does not find a way of genuinely cooperating to resolve these hardest of cases, working within the nuanced and multi-dimensional framework of the R2P norm, hopefully extended and reinforced that framework by some embrace of RWP or RP ideas of the kind I've been describing. If that doesn't happen, the alternative is bleak. It is, it is a return to the bad old days of Rwanda, Srebrenica, Kosovo, which would mean either total disastrous inaction in the face of mass atrocity crimes, or alternatively, of course, action being taken to stop them, but without authorization by the Security Council, in defiance of the UN Charter and in defiance of every principle of a rule-based international order. And after all that's been achieved in the last decade, for that to happen would, I think, be rather heartbreaking. But congenital optimist that I am, with that optimism just a little bit reinforced by these recent developments in China and Russia that I've been describing, I really do believe that policymakers now around the world do understand the stakes involved much better than they used to. I do believe that no one really wants to see a return to the bad old days when appalling crimes against humanity were committed, committed behind sovereign state walls, were seen by almost everyone as nobody else's business. And I really do believe that the imperative for effective cooperation that our common humanity demands will eventually prevail. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to thank Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, ACQC, for delivering the Asia-Pacific Centre for Responsibility to Protect public lecture. And what a superb lecture it was. As his lecture reminds us, it's as important today as it ever has been to think and act constructively at the international level in response to mass atrocity crimes. The doctrine that all states hold a responsibility to protect their own and other citizens from mass violence has become an increasingly important resource in the diplomatic toolbox. But major challenges remain. There can be no better person to apprise us of the development and future prospects of R2P than Gareth. He is, as Tim reminded us at the beginning, the person responsible, perhaps more than anyone else, for forging R2P and adding it to the diplomat's toolbox. His energetic championing and refining of the doctrine have had a massive global influence and impact. Indeed, at a time when academics are being asked to measure the impact of their research and writing, we look to Gareth with awe. <laughs> Few and far between are a nation's foreign ministers, past or present, who have made such a significant contribution to both academic and international diplomatic agendas. Australia is fortunate to have had in Gareth Evans a foreign minister who thought deeply about the complexities and the challenges of world politics, and who also published his thoughts in leading international journals of foreign policy and in major monographs. Gareth is not only a globally eminent statesman and one of Australia's great foreign ministers, standing alongside Dr Herb Evatt, he's also one of Australia's leading public intellectuals. So we're very, very uh, fortunate today to have hosted Gareth for this public lecture. As a small token of our appreciation, I'd like to present a gift to Gareth for taking time out of his hectic schedule to speak to us today. Thank you.